mute yourself. And if you have a question, please raise your hand or put it in the chat. Today, we will be recording the first part of this um, just during the two presentations. And then we will stop recording before the community voices piece to keep residents um, safe. So everyone should have just got that message on their screen. Wonderful, looks like we have a good group of people so far today. So we'll get it started. Um, as everyone knows, today is all about the petrochemical mess that Beaver County is in due to Norfolk Southern's negligence and the train derailment. Um, the train derailed less than five miles from my house. I am a Beaver County resident. We have some other Beaver County residents with us today to talk about their experience. But first we wanted to talk about, you know, it's six months tomorrow. And where are we now? What's the status of testing? What's the status of dioxins and pollution? And for that, we're going to start with independent tester, Scott Smith, who's worked very, very closely with the community um, in Ohio and Pennsylvania. So Scott, I will let you take it away and we'll drop Scott's bio in, in the chat. Okay, well, thanks very much, Hillary. Uh, well, just yesterday, as the Unity Council knows, and in the press today, we um, released our results from Sulfur Run. And uh, I'm gonna go through this presentation uh, that we did publicly yesterday. Why this is important is the narrative about ubiquitous in that environment in the background. This is one of the first times where we're, we're close to ground zero in the sediment of the creek. Why is the sediment important? Uh, because the dioxin molecules settle, they're heavy, and taking surface samples can lead to false non-detects. So what, and you wanna go to the next slide? That's, that's in February, uh, next slide, please. And then in May, May 29th, on Memorial Day, uh, I was with Dr. Rick, chai in, in the creek and we took a soil sample then versus february after the derailment and if you go to the next slide i'll go back up um you will see the trend here with certain dioxin species february 22nd ocdd was 2300 it went up to 12,000. that's six times it's consistent across the fairly across the board with an increase. So now the question is why? Um, we have theories with the expert team around me. What happened between March 8th and May 29th? Well, the ramping up of the remediation, the digging up of the burn pits. And my team and I continue to have concerns about dust and in, in, you know, uh, East Palestine has clay flour as soil. That's not so good when you mix with dioxins. Those dust particles, you're breathing them in and you don't necessarily even see it, even though there's been big clouds of dust. And in, in the prior week, we, we saw some soil samples by Brushville hardware supply that you know were exponentially much higher um, than any of the controls. But back to Sulfur Run, we now have evidence from these preliminary results that dioxins were increasing after the derailment, after the remediation has begun. We have asked the EPA over and over again, are you analyzing the dust for dioxins? The answer is no, they're only you know measuring the particle size. Um, we think the railroad and or the EPA may actually be testing the dust for dioxins that will play out but the dust what's going into the water clearly this is increasing and you hear a lot about dioxins there are hundreds of dioxins and uh the different speciation you hear the narrative about every time you grill a hamburger or hot dog you're releasing dioxins are ubiquitous well that's disingenuous and misleading why because a vinyl chloride burn, a train derailment, um, gives off a completely different fingerprint than grilling. And why this sulfur run testing is so important to everyone, especially in Pennsylvania, 
as we go further away into Pennsylvania, for those of you that have had symptoms and had concerns about contamination, the this dioxin fingerprint can then be matched up to test results on your soil, in your water, and and so on, and to see if it matches the fingerprint from Sulfur Run. And again, this locate these locations are all within 15 to 20 feet of each other, within 100 yards or a football field from ground zero. Next slide. Now, percentage increase, you can see by percentages, we're not talking 20, 30, 40%. You know, we're, we're talking, you know, anywhere from 176% to 644%. And the increase in increase in dioxins. Next slide, please. And you put this in graphical form. You know, preliminary. You know, comparisons here: six seventy versus ninety. That that really puts everything in perspective. Again, this is the first time we've seen a clear and convincing increase in the sediment in the creek in Sulphur Run, and that suggests is something is going on. And if this is increasing in the sediment what's going on in the soil, what's going on in the air. And just this week, I've been made aware of residents literally touching, you know, sod, grass, soil, rash outbreaks. And, you know, clearly there's something going on. And I'm on the record over and over again in the media. You really don't need my testing or anyone else's to prove that something's going on uh, in the community of East Palestine and surrounding areas because none of these health symptoms were ubiquitous or common in the environment prior to the derailment. Next slide, please. <laughs> and the EPA talks about the TEQ, the toxic equivalency factor. And this is a little bit technical that relates to the toxic, one of the most toxic and lethal dioxins, TCDD. But many of the dioxins we're finding don't have a TEQ. So uh, you know, it was 261% more. So the TEQ is one indicator. And for whatever reason, the EPA likes to focus on that and not the other dioxins. Next slide. And you can see that even with the EPA's narrow measure of the dioxins in the, form, in, in the TEQ, we're talking, you know, 65 parts per trillion versus 18 from May to February. So no matter how you how you calculate this, you have a significant difference. Uh, next slide. And again, follow the science. This water and contamination is never in equilibrium. Hence, you literally can't do enough testing. Um, controls are necessary. We do have controls. We, we're working on more. And we, we have been able to preliminarily determined that it does appear that the plume impact versus the controls are significantly different. Every human body burden is different, immunocompromised. And we tell our friends in the government and the EPA, the same thing that applied to COVID applies for this, this, derail, this derailment. 30% of the people may have no symptoms. That doesn't mean the people that have the symptoms uh, are making it up because with there are no, one thing that is clear that the EPA will cite a singular exposure to a singular chemical. Again, that's, that's not completely accurate because you have over 50 chemicals here, uh, all mixing and combining. There are no human standards, exposure standards for a mixture of chemicals. So citing uh, an exposure to one chemical and declaring things safe is just simply not accurate. And it's, it's not a fully informed way to present the data. And cumulative dose, synergistic toxicity, and systemic impact are all terms that we're trying to get the EPA, the CDC, and the ATSDR to address that because everyone's body burden is different. Um, next slide, please. And this is the last slide, and I want to open it up for some questions. The five Ds of the public relations playbook, let there be no doubt about it. There are many ex-government officials that have sold out the taxpayers and the citizens they represent that are heavily involved in setting and, and controlling this narrative out of DC and what is done. And the five Ds are delay, deny, discredit, dismiss. And I added a fifth one with defame 
with what, and we're ready to deal with this. We can deal with it. But I want to close with saying 95, I've been doing this for 17 years and over 60 disasters, over 95% of the workers at the EPA and all the federal agencies, they're really good people. They want to do the right thing. They call me behind the scenes and they are sick and tired of the undue influence coming from the big corporations and those high level EPA people and other government agency people that have basically sold out and are now involved behind the scenes setting policy. So I believe that East Palestine, this is a community that is second to none. And I've been in a lot, and I don't say that lightly. They're smart, they're educated, they're not giving up. And this is a turning point for the whole country to expose this undue influence and do something about it once and for all. With that being said, Hillary, anybody want to ask any quick questions? I'm open for that. Thank you, Scott. And, and Scott's been a, a wonderful help, like I said, to community members in East Palestine and Darlington and Enon. Um, so, you know, we can't thank Scott enough. Um, does anyone have a question for Scott? Please feel free to raise your hand. Um, also, you can put that in the chat. Looks like you're getting a lot of thanks. Yeah, and you've got my email and you can reach me on Twitter and questions and we're doing the best we can to keep up. And what I say is that I'm one person with a team of four experts over 150 years of experience. You'd recognize their names. They can't come out of the woodwork yet. So, uh, you know, and we're up again, a $12 billion budget from the EPA and 17,000 employees. And I'm very proud of working with the community because sometimes uh, people, a, a small group of people can win when the truth is on their side. Amen. Uh, Bob, it looks like you have your hand up. Go ahead and ask the question. Yeah, I was watching something on television to where uh, a legislator from Ohio went over to that one of the creeks. <laughs> I couldn't tell you which one it was, but the creek was flowing perfectly clean. It was it was really nice. And he took a stick, and scraped the bottom. And the next thing you know, you had a gasoline chain on top of the water. Um, he exposed that on the television over there in Youngstown, which I thought was quite descriptive of what was going on. That just because you don't see it on the surface doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And Thank you for bringing that up. And that's the importance of the sediment and why we're focused on that, because it's about the water column. And if you take surface samples, you can game that. And that's a false non-detect. It's all about the sediment at this time and what's being released anytime somebody steps foot in that creek. And on that note, Unity Council was in Washington, D.C. last week. And uh, the, the person that Bob is talking about is J.D. Vance and his team. And the one of his staffers that were in the creek doing that ended up having continued nosebleeds. So it oh. never had nosebleeds in his life. Uh, we just found this out. Um, you know, he and he had nosebleeds for months following that. So that tells you what these dioxins can do to the human body. Um, it looks like we have a question from Alexis. Scott, can we get background data to show the difference between the controls and what we're seeing in East Palestine? Yes, and that background data we have at that first Unity uh, press conference that I did. And it, you feel free, uh, Hillary, and you can make the presentation, the, 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 the short thing I put together for you in the media last night and the prior one, make that available on your website. Great question. And that background data is summarized and available. Thank you. And then it looks like we have a question um, from Dr. Ned Kataire. Uh, what do medical providers and hospitals think about all of this? Um, well, I don't have enough time to get into that, <laughs> but medical doctors, uh, again, undue influence is exercised over them. They tend to gravitate towards conventional doctors just treating uh, a pathogen or a virus or something. And that's why Dr. Beatrice Gullum, who reached out to me, who helped our vets and the burn pits, there really hasn't been a significant event compared to what the burn pits uh, in Iraq and our vets went through until East Palestine and get, you know, no one's gonna find this hard to believe. When Dr. Gollum was involved, the government was dismissing the vets, mass psychosis, it's stress, you're making it up. And just like East Palestine, about 30% of the vets had no symptoms. And, and it's come out that you're, you know, if you're on cholesterol medication, blood pressure, 
and this mixture of chemicals. There are no standards for the mixture of chemicals. For every 10 chemicals, you have a, a thousand different combinations and uh, there just are no standards. And then when you start testing, the doctors and the labs get pressure on them as Hillary and you all know about don't do the testing, you know, it's, it's stress. So again, in the interest of time, I could talk about this for another hour. These are great questions. Happy to take this offline with anybody that wants to reach out. Scott, we just have one more question and I know you'll enjoy this. Um, Julie asked, have you sent your results to the EPA and have they had any response? Yeah, well, the EPA, yes, they have. I have met with the EPA and um, they are on the record in the media and with me, they don't dispute the testing results. I'm using Eurofins, the independent certified lab. The issue is over interpretation in declaring things safe over a singular single expo singular exposure to a singular chemical and it's and again i'll end with this you can't find what you don't look for if you're not testing in the sediment and sulfur run you're not going to find anything if you're not testing the soil on taggart street guess what you're not going to find anything thank you and thank you scott thanks for your continued commitment to us um, in we have in the chat how you can get a hold of Scott. And uh, we'll go to our next speaker, who is Glenn. He started Rail Pollution Protection Pittsburgh, and he's going to walk us through um, what some of these chemicals and then give us some great action items. So, Glenn, I'll, I'll let you take it over. You're on mute, Glenn. You should be good now. Yeah. According to whistleblowers, the following poem was routinely scratched into the walls of most Norfolk Southern locomotives. It pretty much says it all, and it goes like this. Uphill slow, downhill fast, product first, and safety last. In connection with the East Palestine disaster, you heard that Norfolk Southern broke no laws. And that is the problem. Our regulatory system is broken. Corporate greed and regulatory failure have again put the public at risk. And I'll use the East Palestine derailment to illustrate the problem because that derailment and the release and burn were apparently entirely unnecessary and completely avoidable. To fully understand what I just said, we must start by following the money. The New York Times recently revealed that railroads donated $454 million to our US congressional representatives over the last two decades. What the railroad got for its money was an easing of existing safety rail regulations in return for the railroad promising to responsibly self-regulate itself. We now know that this experiment in trust has failed as surely as the Norfolk Southern's train left the tracks and damaged the lives and livelihood of everyone in the East Palestine area. We will continue to have an increasing number of epic derailments because of self-regulation and the adoption by Norfolk Southern of the precision scheduled railroading business model. It's known as PSR. That business model requires strict on-time departure and arrival. It's premised on a 30 to 40% cut in staff, including locomotive engineers, maintenance and inspectors. What could possibly go wrong? In the rail yards, it means a grab and go, unsafe assembly of rail cars, whatever's ready before the departure deadline. The East Palestine train was unsafe because it was 151 cars long, or 1.76 miles, and heavier rail cars were assembled 
behind empty rail cars. When the Civil War era air brake system was applied by the engineer, the front of the train was braked, but the signal to stop, which travels car by car by compressed air, had not yet reached the heavier cars in the rear, pushing the empty cars off the track. Norfolk Southern chose not to use electronically controlled pneumatic brakes, which will stop a train 40 to 60% faster. This is possible because an electronic brake signal travels from front to rear at the speed of light. Recall that the East Palestine derailment was caused uh, ostensibly by a wheel bearing failure. This kind of rolling stock failure could happen anywhere in Beaver or Allegheny counties. Immediately after the derailment, You'll also recall that National Transportation Safety Board Chair Homedy said that the derailment was entirely avoidable. One reason for that is because a wheel bearing that is about to completely fail visibly leaks oil and could have been discovered with inadequate inspection. At that point, the train would have been pulled out of service before it even left the yard. The problem here is that while Norfolk Southern touts safety, behind closed doors, they promote profits over prudence. We know this because of what was said in a complaint that was filed in US District Court in Western Pennsylvania. The FLSA whistleblower was filed uh, on behalf of Russell Puzowski, a Norfolk Southern locomotive engineer for 21 years, working out of the company's Conway Yard in Beaver County. A couple of quotes from that complaint. During a three month period, Puzowski discovered 40 federal safety rule violations that took these trains carrying onboard hazardous materials out of service or delayed their departure. Puzowski was told that the local management team could no longer tolerate the delays because it was causing them to get their asses chewed out by their superiors. And that on-time departure was more important than adequate pre-departure inspection. Puzowski says he was fired for caring for caring and for taking too much time to inspect hazardous trains. Without regard to the outcome of this lawsuit, which was filed in May of 21, and which is still pending, the rest of the inspectors get the message. This kind of pressure is happening at rail yards all over the country. That East Palestine train passed through three rail yard inspections before getting to your town. When railroads self-regulate and cut corners, whole communities will suffer for decades because as we saw in the East Palestine, what we also got was the apparently unnecessary release and burn of 115,580 gallons of highly toxic flammable vinyl chloride. I say that because two days of national safety, national transportation safety board hearings revealed that the manufacturer of the vinyl chloride had stabilized the mixture by removing the oxygen before it was loaded into the rail cars so that it could not explode and was very unlikely. They had shared that information with both Norfolk Southern and their consultants before the decision to release and burn was made. Here's the kicker. Norfolk Southern withheld that information from the Unified Emergency Response Command and from the governor of Ohio. According to the testimony 
of East Palestine volunteer fire chief Drabik, he was told by Norfolk Southern's consultant that he had 13 minutes to make a decision of whether or not we were going to vent and burn because they were running out of daylight. He testified that Norfolk Southern never told him that the manufacturer who was OxyVinyls had advised that it didn't believe polymerization was or could be occurring. Remember also that Norfolk Southern originally justified the burn because of what it claimed were rising temperatures in one vinyl chloride car. Instead of just venting and burning that one car, they burned all five rail cars carrying vinyl chloride. Get this, at the hearing, the NTSB presented a graph that showed that the temperatures in that vinyl chloride tanker that Norfolk Southern claimed was its concern was on a downward trend before the chemical release and burn. It's now also clear that Norfolk Southern withheld other key information from first responders about what chemicals the cars contained for an hour to several hours. Yet, in the first 10 minutes after the derailment, Norfolk Southern sent, it, sent its contractor, consulting firm CTEH, a full list of all of the chemicals in a document known as a train consist. Eric Brewer, Beaver County's emergency management coordinator, testified that it wasn't until late that night or the next morning that I did learn by myself what was contained in those cars. People ask me, why on earth would Norfolk Southern behave like this and waste five tank cars of vinyl chloride? The answer is burn and release would get the tracks cleared faster and get the freight moving again. That is the priority and the mentality. The Chicago to East Palestine to East Coast Refineries rail line is admitted by Norfolk Southern to be the most critical east-west line in its entire system. That line goes through Beaver and Allegheny counties and is among the most intensively used corridors for transport of hazardous chemicals and volatile oil in North America. You must understand <laughs> the magnitude of this train line and the value of the traffic to Norfolk Southern. Two tracks were blocked. The town of East Palestine, your health, and the cost of cleanup are small potatoes. This railroad is making $1 billion a quarter. They will also be recovering money they spent on you from their insurance company and from the rail and wheel car manufacturers. This one derailment just attracted a little too much attention, but they are counting on not much changing. Let's see what else the railroad lobbies payments to our politicians bought for them. Railroad companies are currently allowed to decide for themselves whether to use hot box, box detectors, how far apart to place them, and what temperature trigger to set to signal a stop the train alarm. They can determine safe load limits, how far down to where their rails and their wheels, inspection times, maintenance schedules, engineering standards for rail bridges with little or no independent oversight. They can forego installing more advanced by vibration detectors on the wheels to signal a future wheel bearing failure way before it happens because they rather 
as in Norfolk Southern's case, to an $18 billion stock buyback to their shareholders. Now let's bring this discussion a little closer to home. Your Beaver County towns are within the derailment blast zone of that train line. And it doesn't matter which side of the river you're on. The CSX and Norfolk Southern lines ship hazardous chemicals to BASF and Styropec. In terms of the cracker plant, we know that pipelines are bringing in highly explosive radioactive ethane. Railroads are mobile pipelines. And there is nothing that prevent that wet gas from also being transported to the plant by rail. We know there are storage tanks on the facility for propane, ethylene, C plus three, methane, and butane, all highly explosive. We have no idea what has already been or will be loaded into the rail cars in the future. So Norfolk Southern is sponsoring your farmer's market, but since the cracker plant itself is in the blast zone, there's an even bigger magnitude of risk to consider. Norfolk Southern is transporting 40 to 50% of the most explosive Bakken oil being processed in the East Coast refineries past the cracker plant. Through Pittsburgh's most densely populated neighborhoods and through Philadelphia, that's 2.1 billion gallons per year. According to the Wall Street Journal, each tank car is the equivalent of 2 million sticks of dynamite. And those unit trains are well over 100 cars long. We need to consider that chlorine gas is regularly also transported in rail cars through Beaver County and Pittsburgh. Each car contains 180,000 gallons of deadly chlorine gas under pressure. Any puncture will release the heavier than air cloud suffocating all in its path in 10 minutes. You cannot evacuate Pittsburgh or any town in 10 minutes. Liquid natural gas known as LNG by rail has never been allowed until permits were granted by the last administration. This is in our future, given that 15 processing terminals are being built on the East and Gulf Coast. And whether that happens will depend on the next election. What you should understand clearly is that 22 tank cars of LNG have the equivalent explosive force of the Hiroshima atom bomb. Understand also that right now we have three derailments every day in the US. That is at the lower end of third world ranking and rail traffic will be growing exponentially. If we don't get a handle on this right away, what we will have is a Norfolk Southern nightmare coming soon to a neighborhood near you. In closing, the rail operators are playing Russian roulette with you. Consider that with each passing train, they're spinning the cylinder and we're all literally dodging bullets. I've known for sure, and now everyone now knows, that Norfolk Southern's complete arrogance and disregard for the health and safety of people is what drives our grassroots campaign. RP3 encourages communities to use their voice to contact federal and state officials. The more of this that happens at every level, the more difficult it will be for our elected leaders to serve polluters instead of their constituents. 
We're putting a comprehensive list of action items and state rail policy reforms in the chat and also a link for you to connect to RP3's website and sign up for future rail policy reform, safety and health information. If there is one thing that I've learned in my old age is that you cannot underestimate the power of what a community can do when they stand together. We all deserve power without pollution and energy without injustice. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Um, and we're gonna put some uh, suggestions in the chat on what we can do. And on that note, uh, I, I, I agree with Glenn. That people underestimate what community members can do. And we're gonna take a moment to stop recording this presentation so that you can hear from community members that have been affected by this train derailment um, in Pennsylvania and Ohio. So for those